Hello, welcome to the next episode of Microchurch Next. We're glad you're here. Uh, this is for those that are pursuing uh, simpler expressions of the church that are led by ordinary people. We're kicking off a new series today called The Normies. That is a title of affection and deep respect that God has always worked through normal people. Uh, if you look at the resume of a lot of the people that God has used, it, they're usually unlikely candidates. And one of the things that we believe is true about this particular moment in time uh, is that the first Reformation put the Bible back into ordinary people's hands. There's a second Reformation that's happening right now. It's mm. putting mission back into people's hands. Yeah. And um, one of the things that we're convinced is true is there's been there's like three shifts in how people see mission and ministry the first one is typically you know ministry equals clergy so they're thinking it's some kind of professional you know vocational thing then a lot of times people make another shift and it's like ministry equals volunteerism mm. um and the volunteerism movement has been wonderful in activating people and getting them moving but if volunteerism becomes the end zone, we will accidentally end up domesticating people. Um, because ultimately what this is about is ministry equals all of life and that everybody is a missionary and everybody has a, a personal calling and God's desires for everyone to get to their maximum influence, not just a few. So that's the heart behind this series today. We're glad you're here. We're here to remind you, you're not crazy. You're not alone. And, uh, Brian, what else do we need to think about today as we're kicking things off? Um, well, you might need to embrace a little bit of crazy. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> There's a certain amount of we should step into that. Uh, and I love that language that you use, that we use of we don't want to domesticate the people of God. And, you know, we're doing some write-ups for this series, trying to think through where we want to take this. And it's like when we look back, like you said, at the history of the church, we know there was a moment where... Constantine declares that Christianity is the religion of the empire. Um, and we, we would say, you know, it's like, he's not declaring what, um, what would be, but what was already true. And if you look at the previous 300 years before that, it was just a bunch of ordinary people, you know, it's the, the Smiths and the Masons and the carpenters and all of these people and their little, um, their jobs, the Smiths and the Masons and the Carpenters and their families were meeting Jesus. And they're just doing, you know, they're, they're reorienting their life around who Jesus is, his person, his work. Um, but it was in that moment with Constantine that we see like the, um, the professionalization of a class of people that sort of took um, the church into that new direction. And we've, we've limited the priesthood to an elite few. And we want to tell some stories of of how we're sort of wrestling that back out of the hands and saying all of God's people have these unique masterpiece missions. They've been sent into networks of relationships. They have particular giftings and stories that matter to a network of relationships. To, we see disciple making happen and these extended uh, spiritual families emerge. So we're going to tell some stories. And today we get to hear from Sammy Ortiz. And we're going to hear about a couple of the micro churches he leads. He's connected to the Tampa Underground, which you can go back into um, to the history of these webinars. You can hear the story of the Tampa Underground, uh, hear their convictions around micro churches. And it's, it's often helpful to hear it from the perspective of a leader of a network. Uh, but I think it's more helpful when you hear the people that are connected on the quote unquote, the other side. <laughs> They're right. like, this is like the normal every day, the way we connect to this larger network in our city, the way we love each other, the way that we support each other. So Sammy, welcome. So glad you're here. We're going to stop talking now and let you do the rest of the talking. <laughs> so yeah, let's just start off with this question. You know, we prepped you with a few of just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. What's the snapshot of what makes you, you? Oh, no. It's muted on this end. It might be your in-ears. We're coming, though. We know. No, we're so close, though. I feel so like close. Close. <laughs> I do want to say Sammy is the coolest background. That's true. 
It is a pretty exciting background. No, I don't know what happened, man. We've lost you. Interesting. I wonder what because we could hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Let's keep going. You yeah, know what? I, I, I don't know what happened. I didn't touch I'm, anything. I'm not editing that out because the rest of the world lives on Zoom right now. And that's okay. real, that's yeah, real yeah, life. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, you know, um, I, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, happy Reformation Day to everyone. Hey. Uh, and um, uh, I have a face for audio, so I really don't like being on video. <laughs> but uh, but nonetheless, uh, we're, we're on Zoom. Um, my name is Sammy Ortiz. I am uh, a native of Fajardo, Puerto Rico. That's where I was born. Uh, I am the son of a military career man. Um, I'm an army brat. Uh, I grew up in what would be known as a third culture uh, because of being a military brat. I also, uh, after uh, two years of college, uh, joined the military. I served where I graduated from high school, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I am a Falcon. I am also uh, 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 air assault qualified. I don't repel out of uh, out of helicopters anymore, but uh, wow. rendezvous with destiny for all of my uh, Fort Campbell uh, alumni. And um, but I've been out uh, way longer than I was in. Um, I have been in vocational ministry now for thirty years. Wow. Uh, vocational uh, in quotes because that has changed. The nuance of that has changed, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we live in Wesley Chapel, Florida, just on the uh, in the Greater Tampa Bay area, on the outskirts of Tampa. We've lived here. It's the longest place I've ever lived. Uh, my wife and I uh, and my children have lived here for eighteen years. So um, we, we've been we've been trying. We've been trying to get out, but uh, <laughs> it's just. Uh, we, we haven't gotten orders yet, so we're still here. Still here. <laughs> Sammy, tell us a little bit about your history with the church. Did you grow up in the church? When and how did you meet Jesus? You know, how have you served within the structures of the church? When did that feel limiting? Uh, and just kind of fill us in on that that part of your journey. Sure, sure. Um, I, I grew up my well, it, it's, a, it's a weird story. Uh, my dad grew up Pentecostal but then went to Vietnam and, uh, and all of that changed. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom grew up nominally Catholic. So, um, you know, I, I grew up Catholic, uh, because, you know, mom, uh, mom won that fight, grew up Catholic <laughs> within quotation marks. Um, we did, it wasn't a, it wasn't an overtly Catholic home. It wasn't a religious home, uh, by any means. Um, I did my first communion at 14, uh, but I got a Bible at the age of 12 and I read it and I knew more of the Bible than my CCD instructor. When I did my first communion, I actually, the priest, obviously you're in a partition box. And, uh, you know, he, he said, you know, he asked me to confess my sins. And my response was, I'll confess my sins. When you confess yours, he opened up the partition, <laughs> walked, walked me to my parents and uh, my dad knew enough of the Bible because I quoted to him there's only one mediator between God and man uh, so I mean you know, I was a little punk 14 year old but uh, I was like man we all sin uh, I, I actually wanted I felt a call to ministry at a young age at the age of 12 hmm. until my CZD instructor told me that uh, I couldn't get married and I'm like, man, my hormones were like soaring. And I'm like, you got to be kidding. This is not, this is just not good. And uh, so, you know, um, but I became a teenager, you know, at 14, uh, you know, that whole teenage life kind of, kind of fell away from the desire to be in ministry until uh, uh, after I married my wife, uh, we, mm -hmm. we went back to Fort Campbell, the Fort Campbell area. Stepped into an Assemblies of God church on May 17th, 1992. Mm. Heard Louis Montoya, who's still there at the First Assembly of God in Clarksville, preach the gospel. Mm. And my life was wrecked. Daniel Ramsey came down from the choir loft with the mullet, wow. led us into the sinner's prayer. Yes. I don't know necessarily, you know, and uh, that was the tail the, end of the mullet area. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, but uh, that day. Grunge messed was, that up, man. The grunge right. came in, messed up yeah, the mullet. <laughs> they did that and the flannel. But, uh, and then six months later, I preached my first sermon. And within a year after getting, having that born again experience, uh, we planted a first church in Clarksville, Tennessee. 
I had no sense whatsoever. I don't know why even somebody would even say that's a good idea. But um, (laughs) so from 20, I'm 51. We've planted uh, five traditional or prevailing churches. Okay. And uh, and then six years ago, almost six years ago, uh, felt like uh, I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to be in the rat race Mm. of traditional. If you build it, they'll come. Mm. And uh, decided that I wanted to go house micro. I started reading books by Mike Breen and Mm. just curious. I had not heard about the Tampa Underground and uh, uh, at my local Starbucks, a, a young lady that went to school with my wife made the connection with the underground mm. and uh, the rest has been history. I also affiliate with Converge Worldwide. I've been a part of Converge for the last 15 years. But uh, yeah, every time you plan a church with Converge, they send you an assessment. And uh, when I went through assessment and told them I wanted to plan a house church, they, they were like, uh, what, what's that? And mm-hmm. so... Um, so I'm thankful for the Tampa Underground and Converge. They're both my spiritual family. They're just we're on a we're on a different we're on a different end of that. So you know, well, what was it that began to really stir in you that created that shift from? Okay, I've planted five traditional kind of prevailing model churches, which is exceptional. Yeah, yeah, it's like that's that's a pretty unusual story, and yet there is something at the end of that where you're like. I don't want to be in this particular wineskin anymore. Can you give us a little insight into sure. that part of your story? Sure. I, you know, you, you've got to feed the machine budgets and, uh, you know, volunteers. Nobody wants to serve in children's church. <laughs> Some, you know, uh, the exhaustion of that, mm. the spinning of the plates. Um, mm. And then, you know, wanting to transition to something that was just very simple Mm. discipleship you know, for us, for whatever reason, always came at the tail end. I mean, if you do the math, you know, five, you know, uh, about, about year five, I'm, I'm causing a lot of trouble somewhere. So I need to get out. Um, and so, but because of the fact that discipleship always came at the tail end, I was like, you know, this is not good. And that, you know, a lot of, th- a lot of people that come and consume, they expect you to keep the, the, the shelves, the Walmart shelves of the church, stocked and it's just like you know that's not it really is not the responsibility of those who are equipping the saints to keep the shocks the the stocks shelved for you you know you really need to get into this this thing of assuming the responsibility that you are a a a priest you're a believer and you should be out making disciples who make disciples so i think that because of that tension Mm -hmm. in all of those different uh church plants uh I wanted to do something different, but I didn't know what to do different. And then mm-hmm. I didn't, you know, I, at that time, I really didn't like the whole parachurch idiom. And so um, church planning was the only thing until, until I started reading some books. And I, I thought, wow, I'm, I'm not crazy. Uh, I, you know, these ideas that I have, people are doing them. And, um, and then finally, you know, we pulled the trigger. We pulled the trigger. We left, we left the prevailing model, and started meeting in a in a house, which everybody thought was weird. And <laughs> the, the rest is history. My my living room is packed on Sundays with, when we meet for our house church, and you know I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I don't do sermon prep anymore like I used to, or anything yeah, like that. Right. Yeah. Um, which is huge. Well, I want to come back. I want to come back to hear more of kind of what the expression looks like for sure. Uh, Cause I think people sure. in general are curious about, you know, we hear house church and we bring our assumptions to the table as to what that means. And sure. oftentimes it's uh it's some baggage. That's not actually true at all of what we mean when we talk about micro churches now. Um, but before we get into any of those kind of details, why, why don't you just give us a picture of what you're leading now? So I, I threw it out there that you're leading a couple of different micro churches. Um, but so tell us a little bit about those and how you're serving those networks of people. Sure, sure. So uh, restoration obviously meets in my house. Um, and then there are uh, f- four other ones. Uh I have ADHD, so if I don't switch hats, I get bored, and I don't want to get bored. You know, a brother gets bored, he gets in trouble. But um, it started off with yes, 
my wife and I went to a kumquat festival. It's a little citrus fruit mm -hmm. uh, with about 22 minutes from where we live. We missed our turn and uh, drove a mile um, north and ended up on a street called Lock Street. And uh, the topography changed. Obviously, the beautification funds did not make it to Lock Street as opposed to what they were making at downtown. And so I did not enjoy the Kumquat Festival that day. I was distressed. It happened at the end of January. And I could tell that God was bothering me. Am I frozen? Yeah, a little bit, but okay. We still got uh, I, you know, so. okay. Uh, I, it began to bother me that uh, you know the the way that the people. It looked like a third world country, to be honest with you. Mm. And so for that day, I didn't enjoy it. On April first of two thousand and sixteen, I rented an office space in uh, the Dade City Business Center, uh, and I canvassed the community for one year because I didn't want to go with the savior complex. I live in bougie Wesley Chapel. Uh, Dade City is not bougie. And uh, so I didn't want to come with a savior complex. So one year I asked the community, what, what's the greatest need? And youth were the most underserved demographic in the 33523 zip code. And uh, so from 2016 uh, all the way to May of 2017, after canvassing the community, we started yes. Uh, I, at the time, I was going to the juvenile detention center and the young people were saying, we'd like to do something. But every time, uh, you know, we, we ask for something, they tell us no. And so I had to trick out young entrepreneur students out of yes, because, you know, for black and brown students, hearing no sucks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but the premise of yes is to be a co-working space for youth. Hmm. Uh, we teach them how to start their own business. We teach them, we teach them, uh, you know, innovative thinking. We didn't want to get sued by Carol Dweck and we teach life skills. Uh, and so out of the 60 plus students that have come through 12 have started their own businesses. And uh, we, it's, it's, it's also very Jesus centric. The County Pasco County gives a space to operate out of. So I have an office and a co-working space that the County lets us operate out of. But uh, at the same time, we make Jesus known. We're not bombastic with it. Uh, it's free to the students in the zip code. And then we wait for the question. Mr. Sammy, we know this costs. Why, why do you give it to us for free? And so my answer is Jesus love compels me to love you. Mm -hmm. And this is how I'm showing you his love. And if they keep asking, we keep answering. And if the question stops, then well, I'll just, I'll beat him at uh, PlayStation or whatever it is that we're doing that day. Yeah. And uh, so that's how it all started. But in the process of that, we saw that other demographics, their parents were curious, their kids are now starting viable businesses. So their parents are asking, yeah. uh, can you help us start a business? Uh, and uh, then we thought about felons who, after they do their time, they can't get a job. And then for people of color, sometimes the opportunities uh, just aren't readily available as they are for majority culture. And so, you know, so FEND is Felon Entrepreneurial Development, Economic Development for People of Color. In PSA, we teach uh, uh, English to non-English speakers, predominantly Latinos, because in PSA means start. And then, yes, yeah, so all four of them funnel into restoration, which is the discipleship arm of everything that we do. Awesome. So. Yeah. So it, tell us uh, just maybe one or two stories, you know, where you've seen Jesus working in and through the midst of all that kind of creative, spiritual entrepreneurship. One or two stories. Uh, well, uh, we we garnered the attention of uh, Starbucks. Uh, so um, somehow uh, I. I, I work really out of a four, out of four different Starbucks. So I pitched yes to all of the district managers that have uh, that have been a part of my local area. The third one, when she heard it, said, "Man, we want to jump on board of that." And uh, so Starbucks, the Starbucks Foundation actually has given us some grants. Uh, Starbucks actually facilitates all the managers. There are 16 managers in my local district that facilitate all of our curriculum. And then uh, I have become an unofficial, because Starbucks obviously is a secular corporation, unofficial chaplain for my local district. Awesome. Uh, it's taken 10 plus years of this relationship, but now I do um, conflict resolution 
Uh, I do premarital counseling. I've actually married some of the Starbucks managers locally, uh, but it's all because of going uh, into a coffee shop and calling somebody by name and uh, ordering the same. It's like cheers. Uh, but, you know, but the partnership that has been developed because of uh, what has come out of yes, this has really just uh, helped uh, our local community that we're serving. And then uh, just another cool story of that, we are the first non-corporate, non-collegiate job fair ever done in the history of Starbucks. They came and they actually hired eight of my students from Yes. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I just want to affirm too in that, the, you know, you said you spent a year canvassing the community and then you sort of lightly mentioned the fact that it's taken 10 years to foster this like deep relationship with all these people. And man, that's just something that we want to hit so much with, um, with the network that we get to lead here in Kansas city is this is not fast. It's, it's, it's long, slow work. Rob kind of mentioned earlier, sort of when you, when you were talking, he made the phrase, you have deep roots there. And <clears throat> It's like that's the kind of shift that we have to begin to make in this as well as to stop thinking how big can we make something and more about how long can I stay in a place to to develop enough relationship to really help people move towards Jesus in meaningful ways, not just canned ways. So um, you you said, you know, it's like these um, these different places where you're serving uh, these different networks, they're, they're moving towards restoration, but you call all of these a microchurch. Um, and that's, yeah, that's yeah. part of that culture. So how do you see this as being a church? Cause you're like, I'm, I don't know, the parachurch, whatever. And now it's like, but this is family for you. This is the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, it took, it took a meeting with Jeremy Stevens who showed me some diagrams and, uh, and Lucas Pulley, uh, both telling me, cause I, you know, I looked at it as a nonprofit. And uh, they know oh, that's a microchurch. And finally, I just stopped kicking against the goads about it. Uh, <laughs> um, it took me two years uh, to, you know, connect uh, with with the underground only because, you know, you, you, I've been a part of, you know, multiple church planning movements. And, you know, sometimes you see things that you like and things that you don't. So I, you know, I, uh, I don't kiss on the first date. And so I, I took my time to to get to know them, fall in love with them, realize that they are my spiritual family. Um, and uh, and then, you know, realize that um, the gospel is not limited to, you know, uh, somebody standing on a platform, fake, you know, Shekinah with fog machines and skinny jean wearing dudes. <laughs> and so, you know, I, you know, so I, one, I just can't fit skinny jeans. I'm a big guy, but uh, you know, I, it just, it's, it's the everyday grind of following Jesus. And then at the same time in our, uh, you know, restoration, our tagline is because we're all jacked up in our own jacked up way, uh, making him known. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a, that's an everyday life thing. That's, that's in loving our neighbors. That's in loving the person at the supermarket. That's and when you pump your gas, it's like the matrix, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, you know, the presence of God is everywhere. And so, because I'm indwelled by his presence, his presence is everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. What, what has been uh, the benefit to you of being, connected to this larger network called the Tampa underground. Mm. It is, it, it has been so life-giving for me. Um, one, I'm one of the oldest guys uh, that gets to hang out with some of these young guys. You know, I'm 51. I think Lucas, Lucas is my coach. So Lucas is like 34. I think Tommy, they're all young other than Jeremy. Jeremy's probably in his forties, but uh, um, they're so smart Sometimes I feel out of place in the room uh, when I when I hang out with them. Uh, they're so humble. I didn't have that type of humility when I was coming up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a as a church planner. Uh, and they're so serious about uh, about worship, community, and mission. Mm -hmm. And that for me has been really good because sometimes you know, for a church planner, you know, uh, especially in a Baptist movement, it's about nickels and noses. And, uh, you know, and then the underground, it's just not, it's, it's not about that. It's not about, you know, 
you being a staff person. It's not about you getting paid. It's not about any of that. It's just really uh, for the worship of Jesus mm -hmm. in the context of community as we're doing mission together. And so those are become anchors for me and because it's been modeled so well mm -hmm. by these young men and women within the context of the, of the underground. And so I'm, I'm thankful. I'm th it's sad to me that they've been here this long. I actually pastored a church so close to when they were in Ebor and mm -hmm. I didn't, I I'd heard about them and I thought that they were weird because decentralized in my mindset back then was like who's in charge yeah. you know nobody said doesn't sound like anybody's in charge that's that sounds a little bit chaotic but i i, I love decentralized and i think that you know it's it, it should be something that uh, we kind of take our hands off the steering wheel and, and do what carrie underwood said and just let jesus take it <laughs> yeah you mentioned uh two things that i want to hit on or if uh, well for you to kind of flesh out a little bit more for those that are listening. One, worship community mission. Um, so just in the context of the Tampa underground, what's that mean? Why is that so important? Um, and then, you know, the second piece you said, Jer uh, Lucas is your coach. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to say both of them. Don't worry about the second one yet. I just wanted to say it so we wouldn't forget it. But yeah, talk sure. about worship community mission. Like what's that mean for you and your microchurch? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, in in settings, uh, even coming from the from the prevailing church model, you know, sometimes we do two two out of three or one out of three or something like that. I mean, we're we're we were created to worship God. I mean, at the end of the day, and so uh, these are the three legs, if if you will, of uh, the Tampa Underground Network Worship Community Mission. It's our mantra. Uh, but watching all of those take place simultaneously. Mm -hmm. At first, we weren't doing very well with mission. Everybody can come together. Uh, we sometimes we think worship is singing a song, but it's not. It's you know just the uh, you know the the glorification of Jesus uh, mm -hmm. in the context of being together with other people who have joined with you. You're not doing this on your own. So community is important. Uh, for the aspect of spiritual growth uh, in America, where we're so very independent, interdependence is huge, and it happens within the context of community. And then mission, uh, even though our, our house church is more of a uh, incubator, uh, we have, you know, some, some potential house churches that will grow out of ours. Uh, it's, by leading by example and showing people that, look, you are the priesthood of believer and there is a specific people, neighborhood, uh, section, sector uh, that you are called to make Jesus known in. Mm. Yeah, I, I love that it's um, it's not just a network thing that Lucas and Jeremy and Stacy say, but that like you have embraced it. It's real for you. It's not just like, well, we've got this mission statement at the underground. It's like, no, this is realized in the life of the network leaders, people that are leading yeah. micro churches. Um, but I know one of the things that's important in that, and it's important for the underground, it's important for us that we learned is that ongoing coaching. So like, mm -hmm. what's that, what's that like for you? What is that experience uh, it, it's, it's uh, very loose, it's very <laughs> loose. Yeah. You know, again, coming from a, from a church planning world, uh, a lot of times you're, you're discussing your, your successes and your suck points and, uh, and then, you know, Hey, how can I help you? And, uh, but it's, it, it lacks the relational context. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, one thing I love about being coached by Lucas is that we're not, it's not a transactional relationship, right? You know, um, sometimes it feels like, you know, Lucas is asking a lot of questions. You know, I'm, I'm you know, 17 years his senior. Uh, so, you know, so it, it, it goes back and forth. It is reciprocal. But it at the same time, uh, I feel cared for within the context of my coaching experience. Um, a lot of times, even when I feel like I don't know what I'm doing, I get encouraged because Lucas goes, well, we, I don't know what to do with that either. <laughs> and so it's, it's not coming from a professional point of view, mm -hmm. um, but it's just, I don't know. I think the, the, the mutual encouragement, uh, the, 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 
the spiritual care that's given within the context of that being a part of uh, a community like this. I, it's probably been the healthiest I've ever seen in being a part of a, a movement that is a non-movement. Mm. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense, you know what I'm saying? It's like, we're not a, de- we're not a denomination per se, but uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's so different. It, it, it can feel big because we've 200 plus micro churches in the Tampa Bay area. But when we get together like that for coaching, it's just, it's very focused and it's mm-hmm. small. So it's, it's very unique. It's special to meet with uh, Bishop Lucas. It really is. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of, a lot of. Listen, it's a lot of Indian food. It's a lot of, a lot of coffee. It's, uh, you know, uh, Lucas is a he's a great guy. He is man. So funny. He's a great guy. I'm, I'm, you know, but you know, but they they all are. You know, I get to hang yeah. out with Jeremy and told me so. You know, it, but the, it, and that's I think that would that would be another thing. It's the access. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sometimes. I felt in other movements, like, you know, you get seated at the uh, children's table at Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving and uh, there's no such thing here for anyone. There's no such thing. And so coaching is very, uh, it's, 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 it's very pivotal at the underground, which is, which is huge. Beautiful. It's an amazing community and an amazing network. Yeah. Um, You know, there's uh, likely some people listening right now. And uh, they're they're exploring and open and trying to discern, you know, what's next for them, what what Jesus is calling them into. And so I want to ask you how how might you encourage uh, everyday people that are listening right now, like about, about stepping into their personal calling, like you have? What words would you have to say to them? Wow. Um, I, I think that we are waiting for some type of a sign hmm. and, um, I, you know, everybody frequents the same places. Like I come home every night cause I, my wife would not like that otherwise. So I come home. So my neighborhood is my parish, hmm. you know, so I, I'm coming home. So be a good neighbor. You know, maybe God is calling you to reach your neighborhood. I frequent Starbucks a lot. So, you know, same thing. You will go to the same grocery store, you know, you'll go to the, you know, you'll go home, you go to work. And so find the people that uh, are open Mm -hmm. relationally. And then I think that the biggest thing is relationships. Uh, You know, who are you involved with relationally? Uh, Hopefully we don't make the same mistake of being in the ghetto of just our, you know, just our few, but who are you in relationship with people who have yet made a faith commitment? Mm -hmm. And I think start there. Maybe, maybe you like sports. Like I have picked up playing pickleball because I need another pond (laughs) to, uh, to, to fish in. And so I go play pickleball with, you know, a bunch of people that don't know anything about me and Jehovah sneaky will show up somewhere. And so, you know, (laughs) I, I, uh, so I, I think that, you know, just, thinking, you know, I believe that Jesus is calling me to just cut my neighbor's yard in hopes that they will ask why I'm being kind without it being bait and switch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it's just sometimes just being a good neighbor, being kind, being a good neighbor to your coworker, bringing them coffee every now and again, or whatever the case is, but don't look for this fireworks and whatever it's i think it's in the simplicity of Mm. just serving Mm. yeah well you have a unique voice in this conversation that we're we're having right now with interviewing the quote-unquote the normies um because you've planted five churches you've been a part of leading from a hierarchical standpoint now you're in a decentralized network we're calling you a normal person, even though it's clear you have amazing gifts, like you can't just throw down on five church plants. Um, but you can encourage everyday people because you're doing it. You felt this, like Jesus is prompting me in this thing. I'm going to go be obedient. And you walked into it, but you can also speak to it from, Hey, I've been on staff at a church. I've led teams from that angle. 
So like Rob mentioned, there's probably people listening that are exploring, they're curious, how do I step into it? But there are also people that are listening who are still leading in the predominant model of the church. And if you were to speak a word of encouragement to them, like how do you encourage leaders to think beyond just programs within the four walls and really look at the people that are a part of their congregations and think, how do I inspire these people to be more missionally creative or... Mm -hmm. How do I release some of the power? What would you say for them? I mean, that, that can be scary for a, a leader. You know, I mean, I was a senior leader for a long time. Um, but uh, I think that the uh, the damage that it can do sometimes, I almost lost my marriage <laughs> mm. uh, because of ministry. Ministry became my mistress. And so I did take a hiatus from it. And then realized that my identity was, you know, titular, you know what I'm saying? I was a senior or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then realizing that I am a child of God, which is probably the best title anybody could have. Mm -hmm. I'll say that first. Um, and then, um, as somebody that is probably in vocational ministry and you know, the church is changing, you know, uh, like my wife and I just came back from, uh, from, Boynton Beach, uh, West Palm Beach. Mm. And we saw a church that has been turned into an art center. Mm. And I think of Europe, you know, here we are today on Reformation, uh, Reformation Day, and a lot of pubs uh, are now, you know, pubs that used to be churches, a lot of, you know, clubs. And I think that, you know, if, if we don't see the writing on the wall, as far as American Christianity, it's changing. Mm. And so I think that we need to pivot. Uh, we need to pivot. And, and pivoting may mean that for somebody that's in vocational ministry, uh, maybe your salary is changing, maybe money is down and all this, uh, which is freaking people out. But uh, you know, God may be calling you to something completely different. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, his provision is going to stop or anything like that. Cause that's probably one of the main questions that I get from my brothers and Converge. Like, how do I get paid? And, uh, you know, I, you know, one of the things that we need to evaluate it is if we're doing this for money, then mm. why are we really doing it? But that's for another, that's for another thing. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but no, to encourage, I would say uh, the same way that, that you felt the call of God to plant uh, in the style that you planted, Jesus still calls, mm. uh, you know, in, in, into uh, Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria and to the ends of the world. And, you know, your Judea may be your neighborhood mm -hmm. as a pastor. You may be the pastor of your neighborhood. You may be the pastor of your YMCA or whatever. And so mm -hmm. I don't think that the shepherding heart ever leaves the individual. It's just different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's with, I don't want people to know that I'm a pastor. I just, it kind of shuts people down. So mm -hmm. my birth certificate says Sammy. And so that's a, uh, <laughs> sometimes that's hard for those that have been in leadership it's hard for them to let go of those titles and things i don't know if i answered your question well but uh you know, these are the things that i've had to you know die a million deaths to mm. so uh, sam we're really grateful uh for you sharing your story for your example uh for those that are listening right now uh, i just want to bless you in the name of jesus with missional imagination Thank you. Uh, to see what Jesus sees about your context that you're in. And for those of you right now, they're feeling maybe a sense of fear or anxiety um, that you would tell Jesus about that yeah. and you would talk to him. And behind that emotion is a need that only Jesus can meet um, and open up to that. And don't let that keep you from the great thing that he's calling you uniquely to do. You are called to be a priest somewhere. And uh, Sammy, thanks for showing us what that looks like. We're really grateful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you for what you guys do. Cause you know, this is, it's not for the faint of heart. And, uh, but it's a whole lot of fun. Yeah, it it's is. It's a whole lot of fun. <laughs> it's yeah. fun out here. <laughs> yes, it is. It's it lots is. of room on the outside, man. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's yeah. That's fun. I'll just chime in on that too, just to say, you know, thanks for, for giving a picture of it. And we, we wanted to be careful with this series, not to tell really personal stories. 
not to not for Sammy to get on here and go let me tell you about so and so and the because it's like that that's that's their story that's their journey and that belongs to them it's sacred um and so what we really want to highlight is all of the other things about it that's like you're connected to a network you're not just out here running rogue doing your thing you know you value uh, deeply these components of worship community mission it's not just come out here and do this thing um like there's so much structure behind it and depth and foundation um and what i hear too is just your heart to honor jesus in all things mm -hmm. um so thank you yeah thanks for spending some time with us sharing that story and yeah i encourage those that are listening to as well just uh, apart from the things rob said just to take a moment when this is over and spend a few minutes in listening prayer and see what Jesus has to say and then go join him mm -hmm. and then join us next time for another story about the normies. <laughs> How you like that ending? <laughs> that was great. That was great. <laughs> All right, that Sammy. I uh, hope to meet you the next time we're down in Tampa. That'd be great. That'd All be right. Great. Thanks for joining us. Yes, sir. Bye-bye.